Hello, Poetry Sorati. I'm Jazz Glati, and this was such a geeky chat about extractions. Like recently, we had a geeky chat on onlays with Dr. Ash Lifts, and she was brilliant. And Dr. Amir Ali Bokas today covers real world exodonture. Like, imagine you have a bleeder. What are the best ways to manage a bleeder, both in the short term and in the long term? And unlike all the papers we read or all the other lectures we go to about this, we actually go straight for the kill. Like what I mean is all the information that you could gain from guidelines. Like there are some guidelines in the UK, there are guidelines uh, all around the world, basically wherever you practice, about how we should manage patients who are high risk of bleeding. Now, I didn't feel as though it was worth your time to just revise all the guidelines because you guys can just easily pick up the guidelines and read them. So. The kind of scenarios we discuss are the ones whereby you've done all the medical history checks, you've done all the medicine check, and you've got a normal bleeding risk patient, yet they still bleed afterwards. Or they call you eight hours later and they say they're having a bit of a bleed. How do you manage those scenarios? And then much, much more. We just really go in deep into all the facets of exodonture. The protrusive dental pearl is very relevant to exodontia and something that we actually discussed in this episode. It's about having a plan. So for example, for a crown prep, you might have a plan that looks like this. It's just from the top of my head. I haven't written this down. So it's like a medical history check, consent procedure, give LA, take a putty impression so that you can make a temporary crown afterwards, remove all the old restoration caries, build your foundation or core restoration, then do the occlusal reduction, interproximal reduction, create a chamfer if you're getting shoulderless like I do nowadays, no shoulder, but a shoulderless preparation all the way around, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like you have a step-by-step -step plan. And sometimes like, hey, if I have lots of bleeding from the gingival sulcus, I will use this retraction cord. However, if I don't have much bleeding, I will use this technique. And if I have this issue, I will take a scan. If I have that issue, I might take an impression. You see, there is a plan, but then you account for, well, if this happens, then I'll go in this direction. And if this complication happens, I'll manage it like this. And actually, sometimes there's too much bleeding and you decide that you stick on a temporary crown and that initial plan of taking an impression is no longer valid. So you have to be able to ready to change your plan. So it's the same with extractions. So just like that, with extractions, we should also have a plan. So for example, you've done all the medical history, consent, uh, you've given your LA, what type of LA will you give for this patient? And then you go in with, okay, I'm going to start with luxating uh, and then I'm going to start elevating. If I see some movement, then I'll continue. But if I don't see any movement, I'm going to start sectioning. I'm going to section uh, in this place and that place. Now, if I mess up my section, here's how I'll recover it. Which route will I remove first? And then if a bit more of the crown breaks, how will I retrieve that? At what point will I raise a flap and remove some bone? if required. So just like that, having a plan really helps your extractions. It's something I never really appreciated, but it's actually so important kind of coming from a restorative background. Now, just before we join the main episode of Amir, I, I am letting you know that around about 10, 15 minutes time, I will be playing a ad for a fundraiser. As some of you might have seen on my Instagram, I'm raising money for a little girl called Nafisa. She's one year old uh, and she's the daughter of a patricianity, a dentist just like you. And she suffers with SMA type one. I'm going to go into it in detail, but please, if you can support this fundraiser, it would really mean a lot. And if you're not in a position to support it financially, would you consider please sharing it? Okay, so the best place to share it would be for my Instagram. I put all the show links below, but that is coming. I really, really want to help Sakina and her daughter. So please do stay tuned for that. Oh, and by the way, the first part of this podcast, we discuss our journeys, our growth, our failures, and talk about career decisions. So I hope you enjoy that. But if you're here for the bleeding complications, then I would probably just skip to a minute 15, because that's when you start talking about bleeding complications. Either way, I hope you get what you want from this episode. Dr. Amir Alibokas, welcome to the Protrusive Dental Podcast. How are you, my friend? I'm great, Jez. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's, it's nice to reconnect with you. I remember you from like yeah. back in the dental school days, like over, over yep. 10 years ago, uh, and it's nice to go full circle. Uh, what have you been up to, man? Like, you know, where are you now? And what was your journey in the last 10 years or so like? Okay, I'll try to summarize it as quickly as I can. Yeah, so I, I started at Birmingham, graduated DF1, and then I just fell into the Max Fax oral surgery uh, world, and I existed there for three or four years. I worked at Eastman, Great Ormond Street, UCL, Queen Elizabeth, and then I found myself in an interesting position. Uh, I started locuming and I was I was working at the Royal Cornwall Hospital as an SHO. And through circumstances, I'm, I'm not going to go into, uh, they ended up without a staff grade. And they, I've always been passionate about oral surgery. And, you know, we can talk about that as well. But um, they just said, we don't have a staff grade. You're pretty good. Do you want to do it? I was like, okay. And at the time, I was just being thrown in the deep end. I had my own GA list. Wow. my own sedation lists and i was uh, th three years out at this point <laughs> um 
and I'm, you know, I'm leading who checklists and things and running GA lists. And luckily I had, I had good support from the consultants and I learned from some fantastic people and they always had my back. I didn't have to call them that often, but it was nice knowing that I had that support. And that's where I really cut my teeth in oral surgery, so to speak, pun intended. Uh, and, um, and on top of that, I was then training DCTs because the, it was a training hospital as well. So, um, and you learn a lot when you teach people because so you have to go and research and, and find out what you're actually talking about. So, uh, it's a taxonomy of learning, isn't it? The Bloom's yeah, taxonomy of learning. The exactly. highest is when you're having to teach the stuff, then you know you got to pick it up a grade or two. So that, that's yeah. good. And then where have you been in the last couple of years then? Yeah, so after that fellowship leadership program uh, under Jason Wong, amazing seeing behind the scenes of how everything's run. And he's doing a great job as interim and hopefully he'll stay on and uh, work things for us from the inside, which would be great. Then I um, joined uh, UK Sedation. So I, th I think you've had someone on the podcast before, Roy Bennett, um, yes. on uh, a Sedation podcast, really good. So I work with him and Rob, and that led me into this kind of visiting dentist role, uh, where I visit as a sedationist, and I also visit practices and performing oral surgery. So treating anxious patients, extracting complicated teeth, uh, dealing with patients with complex medical histories. And amongst that, I've spent some time teaching at Manchester Dental Hospital as well, supervising the students there. And yeah, now where I've landed is um, basically IMOS, visiting oral surgery, visiting sedation, and mentoring as well. So I have a lot of people who want to learn oral surgery. And uh, I mean, I'm not a professor of oral surgery, but when it comes to, you know, GDP exodontia, then... I have a thing or two I can pass on and um, and I'm always learning as well because I'm teaching. So it's great. And I work with a lot of great consultants who are constantly teaching me. So it's the circle of life in, in our profession, I guess. And that's where we are now. Amazing. Uh, and, 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 and just so, you know, just so we get some inspiration from, from your position, you, you're not on the specialist list, right, for oral surgery, or are you? No, no. I had my heart set on it, but um, life happened and it didn't work out that way. It's got to the point now where I'd love to be a specialist, but um, I'm, what, I'm what you call a dentist with a special interest or a specialty mm -hmm. doctor uh, in oral surgery. And to be honest, I'm through the work I've done and through the sedation, seeing all these amazing surgeons in different practices, it's really opened my eyes to other specialties. So specialty isn't off the uh, table, but I don't think it'll be oral surgery. I think it's probably going to be something I'm less experienced in, so I get more out of the training. But that's a whole other conversation. Okay, brilliant. Well, uh, you know, that's in inspiring in a way, because you, you said that you had your heart set on it, and I had my heart set mm. on restorative specialist for, for the longest mm. time. I said, I would definitely want to be a restorative specialist. And then when I experienced hospital dentistry, and I, and I compared it to the private world, and, and this is nothing to do with finances, it's purely the pace of work. And I, and I mm. asked myself, what, what is it that I really want out of this training position? And I just wanted to be able to do transformative, rebuildative yeah. dentistry. I wanted to be able to treat toothwear cases. I mm. wanted to be able to do restorative dentistry at a really high standard. And mm. I realized that actually I didn't have to go through all this training to be able to do that. And I, and I look at you and I, you see, you know, and, I'm, and I'm not putting words in your mouth, so please correct me, but a lot of the people I speak to who are aspiring oral surgeons. They just want to be able to take out teeth, like amazingly wisdom teeth and feel competent and, and, and not feel, uh, you know, with, with flaps and uh, yeah. exodontia and, and, and do a great job with that. Not everyone wants to do all the, the niche things within oral surgery. It's a bit like restorative specialists, you know, not everyone wants to do the obturators for oral cancers and stuff mm. and, and that kind of stuff. Those mm -hmm. who do, they're saints and they're amazing. We need those people, yeah. right? So did you, do you now feel as though that if you were to speak to a younger colleague who has their heart set on oral surgery specialty, you know, what advice would you give them in terms of what is it you actually want from that desire? I think you have to, the way I always explain it to people is uh, if a bunch of aliens visited the planet and they were like, right, what do you do? And it's, uh, well, I'm a dentist who's really good at taking out teeth. And what do you do? I'm an oral surgeon. So what's the difference when it comes to exodontia? So there's an asterisk there. I think people get really bogged down with titles and waiting for an institution to rubber stamp you. But at the end of the day, oral surgery is about doing. And some of the best surgeons I work with are not oral surgeons. Now, having said that, the best surgeons I've ever worked with are max vac surgeons, certain max vac surgeons. <laughs> so I have the utmost respect for specialists and oral surgeons. I've worked with a lot of amazing oral surgeons who I sedate for. And beyond exodontia, they will, they'll do the cysts and the, hem, the uh, bimax osteotomies and things like that. You know, the really advanced stuff. And I think what's happening in our profession, and you'll notice that with the dental therapists as well, we're increasing the scope of practice for a lot of members of our team. And as dentists, we're evolving into those, what we used to look at as 
specialist roles. So taking out a horizontally impacted wisdom tooth doesn't have to be the realm of the oral surgeon anymore. That can be the realm of the dentist who spent a lot of time training in oral surgery. And that allows the specialist more time to focus on those larger cases and those more complex cases because... I- impacted canines, another one, right? Exposing canines and stuff, uh, GA lists. Even mm-hmm. exposing canines, you know, and extracting ectopic canines, if you have a good mentor, you can learn to do that. And it can be within your scope of competence as a GDP. Mm-hmm. There might be a lot of oral surgeons watching this screaming at the computer right there saying, no, it's not. But honestly, it, at the end of the day, it's doing. It's getting your hands dirty and it, it's just doing the cases with a mentor who can give you some feedback and guide you. But what I'd say to young dentists is if you want to do oral surgery, do oral surgery. Don't wait for someone to give you permission to do oral surgery. Do it with a mentor or have a backup plan in case it doesn't quite go the way you want it to. But just do it is uh, is my advice. Great advice there in terms of getting stuck in. My own personal experience with oral surgery was did uh, dental core training in oral surgery. And I watched and I saw a lot of surgery. It was like monkey see, monkey do kind of thing. And had my hand held as I was doing. Mm. It was more watching mm-hmm. than doing, I'll be honest with you. So a lot of the doing I had to do at the edge of my comfort zone and growing yeah. and growing and growing and take a few calculated risks here and there mm-hmm. and some continuing education. So now I'm very good at cherry picking which surgical wisdom teeth I will mm. do. I'm very happy to do that as a, as a GDP and most teeth I look at and I can I know they'll be tricky but yeah. because of the ability to sh- section and elevate and raise and not be afraid of raising a flap as a GDP I have so much confidence going into cases which would pr- previously I'd be really scared of and I know a lot of our mm. colleagues are really scared when it comes to expansure mm. they, they kind of refer a lot of things which they should be taking out and mm-hmm. I think sectioning and elevating really gives you that uh, ability that confidence to ta- tackle teeth that otherwise you wouldn't be able to w- would you agree with what I'm saying here. Yeah. I mean, what surprises me is, you know, you have people cutting crown after crown and that's a very technically complex thing to do if you think about it, because you're working in in millimeters and you're working around occlusion and various other factors that you have to take into consideration. If you can cut a crown, you can section a molar. You know, it's much more blunt than a lot of the fine restorative work that people do. Now, having said that, what I, as an IMAX practitioner, I'd say I get a lot of um, teeth that people have had a go at. And the problem I have with that is, first of all, it makes it a lot more difficult for me to extract, although it, it keeps me up on the edge of my game. Uh, but the other thing is it, it can traumatize the patient sometimes. So I've had patient, I had one patient who came in and we'd given the local anesthetic, but he'd had such a bad time with the previous extraction that he just didn't want to uh, carry on and, and just got out of the chair and wanted to leave. And he's been rebooked to have it under sedation. So what I'd say is I think G- GDPs should be having a go and, and extracting teeth and learning, but try and find a colleague or a mentor who's happy to be in the room and be ready to come in if it doesn't quite go so well, or even just be there in the room with you. And that's how I learned, and that's how um, GDPs can learn as well. And, you know, for my part, I'm always happy to come to practices and work with people who want to learn. And at the same time, I still shadow oral surgeons, and I'll, procedures that I've done a thousand times, I'll still do it with them because I'll, I'll see a different technique or a different approach or a different way. Because I've worked around the country, I've got to see the, a variety of approaches for the same procedure. And it means that when I get stuck, I'm running through the options in my head, I'm running through the playbook and looking at how can I get myself out of this um, based on what I've seen in the past. So a lot of word salad, but the key points are find a mentor, don't be afraid to take on challenging teeth, but just make sure that you have a backup plan. And that's uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> I've spoken about this before, and I won't go to too too much of it. But you know, on a theme of oral surgery episodes, you know, I remember being two years qualified and uh, attempting a lower first molar, uh, decoronating it, and I just couldn't get the roots out. And I felt mm. embarrassingly I had to let, let the patient go. And then, and when I did it the second time, I had to quickly send it to my principal, who was five miles away and the patient had to drive 45 minutes there and oh, the, 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 the big lesson there was I just spoke to my principal I was like you know, what did you do to get the tooth out he said it was easy I just had to section the roots yeah. and that stuck with me right so much which is why I bang on about it so much I was like okay, I need to why, why haven't I learned this I need to learn this and when I learned that I haven't had those issues since but what I would say I completely echo what you're saying Amir is that if you're a young dentist or just not experienced enough instructions as you would like to be, not as confident as you would like to be, please don't shy away from it. Take the calculated risk, but please have someone next door prearrange, mm. have that check. Hey, you know what, Thursday, I've got a tricky one. Can you just make sure you're on standby to rescue me should I need rescuing? 
that's the best way to grow. And, and I think oral surgery uh, you know, would really benefit as a whole in terms of our, our, our skill level. If we just had those calculated risks with someone there to help us and mentor us, it would be great. So I to totally echo what you're saying here. Mm -hmm. Today, though, is about bleeders, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> let, let's make it very cl clinically relevant. Mm -hmm. That's why I, just, I mean, we could go down. And I, initially, I was thinking, should we talk about a Pixaban and Warfarin? And mm -hmm. what should we do if they're on aspirin and a Pixaban and that kind of stuff? And you know what? A lot of this stuff is on guidelines. And I realized yeah. that the protruserati are an international audience all over the world and the guidelines that we have in our yeah. little island might be different to what they have yeah. in a lot of other countries so i was thinking okay maybe we save that to the end let's go real world right L literally this happened to me the other day actually this scenario i'm going to say for scenario number two and that happened to me the other day we'll all talk right. about that scenario number one is you take out a tooth right let's say it's mm -hmm. an upper molar okay take yeah. it out you know for me typically an upper molar i just 80, 90 percent chance I will be sectioning it and then removing it as atraumatically as possible. That's just what I do nowadays. Uh, interestingly, I would just like to know from you: Is that do you just routinely go in and section, or do you just try attempt forceps subtraction first? <laughs> uh, it depends how many patients I have on my list. Such a uh, real world, <laughs> such a truthfully spoken answer. <laughs> yeah, I'm honest, man. I'm, I'm telling how it is, yeah, and it depends what they want at at the end of it. You know, like if a patient wants an implant then I'm going to do my, I'll always do my best to preserve the buccal plate and make sure there's a lot of bone left and be as atraumatic as possible. But, you know, if this is being added onto their acrylic denture, they're not that bothered. They don't want to be in the chair too long. They hate the sound of drilling and they just want the tooth out ASAP. Then I'll look safe, I'll get movement and I'll, I'll uh, gently achieve mobility and, and uh, slowly lift that tooth out. But gold standard is just section the teeth if you can. Uh, but it's an analysis of the x-ray, you know, sometimes the roots aren't spread out enough to clearly section. You might end up making a mess. If the roots are, are really close together, you fused might be better together. off luxating, fused, um, yeah, uh, better off just luxating and, and elevating out. So you have to look at the pre-op x-ray and just decide, is it worth sectioning? Because uh, there's, there's, let me put it this way, there's not a hard and fast rule. You don't have to be dogmatic about this. You approach it each case individually. But yeah, sectioning, if you can get good at sectioning, it just makes it that much easier. And, and just practice, practice, practice. And when you extract teeth, look at, just analyze the roots, look at them. I, I still mess up my angles. You know, I'll, I'll go and section a tooth and sometimes I'll be a bit too distal. I wouldn't have got the angle quite right. And I'll beat myself up about it. You're not going to get it perfect every time. I don't. Oral surgeons don't. Maxwax consultants don't. Hey guys, it's just Jazz interfering with a timely message. Me and Amir have just discussed the importance of sectioning and elevating, but so many dentists reach out to me saying, I need more help. Are there any courses that I can go on? And sometimes you want that knowledge now, then and there. You don't have to wait for the course. So what I've done is recorded lots of extractions that I'm doing that demonstrate the through the loops view of sectioning. I'm gonna call this sectioning school. It'll be kind of like the isolation library on the app, but it'll be video after video after video of exodontia specifically sectioning roots. If you wanna stay up to date with this, then join protrusive.app or hit the subscribe button below so when it comes out, you will be first to know. Now to a more serious and kind of sad message, but I really need to hear and support. So over to the next message now. Producer Rati, I'm very emotional right now, and there's going to be like a little bit of an emotional plea. So really, you know, listen out. This is really, really important. I'm a father of two boys. One is age four and one is five months. And what I've learned as a father is you, you look for milestones, right? So when they're about four months, you start to look, okay, are they able to, to roll over? Are they able to turn around, roll over? And around about six months, you know, can they support their neck fully and can they sit up properly? And, and you look, and these are special moments as a, as a father, as a mother. And some of you listening, Patricia Rati, might be grandparents or some of you don't have children in your life yet. If you, if you want them, then something to look forward to, right? Now, imagine you have a child who at four months is not rolling over yet and is not able to support their head very well. And you get to six months and, and still no rolling over. And then you take him to the doctors and you find out that they have a rare disorder called spinal muscular atrophy, SMA. Now, this doesn't affect my son who's five months old, Sihan. It, it affects a little girl called Nafisa. Now, Nafisa is a one-year-old girl in Tanzania. Now, what has this got anything to do with, with, with you guys? Well, she's the daughter 
of a Petrus Ranti. Just like, you know, you guys listening right now, you listen to this podcast, you have a connection, we learn, we grow together, and it's amazing the community we've built. But Sakina is a dentist, and we've been speaking by email for some years now, but recently she emailed me asking for help out of desperation. Because Nafisa was was born and di- well, she was diagnosed at six months with SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. And basically, there's a gene called the SMN1 gene. And basically, it means that she has a weakness in her muscles. Now, because of this missing gene, she's not able to feed or even b- breathe properly. And so sometimes she needs ventilation. Sometimes she needs to use a nebulizer. A lot of times they're aspirating because even the swallowing is affected. Now, there is a treatment possible for Nafisa. It's basically like this genetic therapy. And this genetic therapy is made by a company called Novartis. It's a Swiss-based company and it's quite popular in America and Europe. And basically, if this therapy is given to Nafisa before the age of two, there's a 90% chance that she's going to live a normal life, which is just amazing, the prospect of it. The problem is this therapy costs over 2 million US dollars. They've actually sent me the bills and the statements and stuff and I've seen it and it's quite crushing to, to, to see that because I'm putting myself in the shoes, like put yourself in the shoes of Nafisa and Moise, who's Nafisa's father, who's actually a doctor and he works many months in the US and then he comes home to Tanzania and he, he works in the US to make enough money to be able to keep the dream alive so that we can get this genetic therapy for Nafisa. If this genetic therapy isn't given to a child with SMA by the age of two, then what happens is atrophy takes place and it's not going to be successful. So guys, we need to raise money for Nafisa, right? Because I had a good think about it. And as a father, I'm putting myself in the shoes of Sakina and Moise. And if my child or if your child was affected by this rare genetic disorder and you suddenly had to raise, you know, two million pounds, two million dollars, whatever it might be, wouldn't you find any way possible any means possible to try and raise this money and this is exactly what they're doing tanzania is a third world country we're trying our best and can you believe it that even in this country they've raised over half a million dollars already so there is so much hope that we need to raise around about 1.3 million dollars in the next six to eight months to reach the goal to be able to help nafisa and I know that's a lot of money. And, and, and you know, Sakina and Moise, they know that this is a lot of money. But if it was your child, wouldn't you be doing the same thing? And this is exactly why I'm coming to you guys, because I, I always imagine I put myself in their position. Like, you know, if my child was diagnosed with this, I would be doing this exactly right now. I'd be pleading to you guys, can you help? Can everyone, can all the dentists listening to this just club together and donate 10 bucks, 50 bucks, 100 pounds, wherever you can. As a practice, do a fundraiser, do whatever you can, because I truly believe, and Sakina believes, and Moise believes, that if all the dentists club together, if all the doctors club together, we'll make more than what's needed. We can have many more children. But for Nafisa, this, this girl who's just so smiley and so innocent, and her parents are so determined to help her, and they've done such an amazing job so far. I really want to help them through this platform, through this community that we've built, Patricia Rati, that I really, really want you. I really need you to donate to this cause. So if you can spare any cash and donate, you can help Nafisa. We give her uh, ventilation via BiPAP machine. We provide her suctioning. We provide her nebulization. So you can imagine the stress that we are going through as uh, parents. She's taking care as a full-time mom now. And I don't want her, her studies to go in, into waste because she's very passionate about being a dentist. If you are a parent, if you want to be a parent, if you're a grandparent, if you can just put yourselves in the shoes of these parents asking for money to help Nafisa, or if you just love learning from this podcast, even just for that reason, could you just please go to the GoFundMe page and donate today? I would really love for the legacy of Petrusinal Podcast to be that we club together as a community to help Nafisa. So please go to the GoFundMe page. I've actually made this page protrusive.co.uk forward slash Nafisa. That's N-A-F I-S-A. That's her name. Okay. So if you go on her Instagram as well, it's smiles for Nafisa. Every episode, I'm going to keep you guys updated on how we're doing in terms of how much money we raised for Nafisa. At the moment of the time of recording, it's six, just over $600,000 raised. If this is one thing you donate to this month, make it this one. That's protrusive.co.uk forward slash Nafisa. Thank you so much, Petrus Ranti. So don't don't shy away from it. And it's it's not always going to be perfect, but it's going to make it a hell of a lot, a lot easier if you get good at it. So um, it, it reminds yeah. me of something I was taught as a DCT, which is, I mean, it sounds very routine to you, I'm sure, Amir, but mm. a lot of people listening, right, this, especially younger colleagues, this is a really good lesson in oral surgery, I think, is like, have 
a plan. I know it sounds really funny, and you'll think, yes, I heard this one before. Like having a surgical plan, it, it, even when it comes to yeah. exodonture, is, is really important. Yeah. And I never appreciated it when someone, my an oral surgeon, first taught me this. Uh, guys, I was like, oh, okay. Usually, I just start with the luxators and I see what happens. I just make it up as I go <laughs> along, and you know, see which way the tooth's going, and uh, you know, you just you, you're you're running on adrenaline, you're just figuring yeah. out what's the next move. But actually, if you, you should actually go in with, okay, I'm first going to try this. If this works, I'll do B. If this doesn't work, I'll do C. For example, right? Yeah. And so yeah. when when you get good at sectioning, it actually opens up a whole new pathway to you. So, for mm. example, uh, that case who suggested that you know if, if it's part of a denture and uh, he doesn't, they, they don't like the drilling, and you're going to try and go f- uh, four steps only. But then, if it was to fracture, then because you can fall back on, okay, now I'm going to go with my plan B, you can still yep. do that efficiently, right? Yes. So it's really important yep. to, another reason to have that skill is that actually mm. uh, there's only so much you can do with having just one skill set, one way to, to do things. One way to skin a cat is not going to be enough. There's many ways and we need to, to explore them all and that's part of your growth in oral surgery. So anyway, you remove this tooth, right? <laughs> back on yes. the bleeding. You remove this <laughs> yep. tooth and typically get, get the gauze wet a bit mm-hmm. and for, I, you know, mm-hmm. it's dental students, I was taught to wet the gauze because... I'm glad uh, you said you don't that. Wet the, yeah, yeah, good. Okay, I'm glad <laughs> Well. So <laughs> if you don't wet the gauze, okay, and then you take it out afterwards, the blood clot will, will stick and it'll come yeah. out, right? And that's like an yeah. instant dry socket, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know if it actually works like that, but okay, mm-hmm. uh, let, let's assume it is. So yeah, let's wet the gauze. Let's sort of squeeze it, get the, the, most of the moisture out, get, get the patient to bite on it. We are not squeezing sockets. Oh, do we? Can we agree on that? Yes. Now, I, I don't know where that came from, but when I was in dental school as well, they, we'd take a tooth out and, be, and now squeeze the socket. Yeah, yeah, I was taught that now, too. What the hell was up with that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, now I'm like, why would you do that? That's the worst <laughs> thing you could possibly do. But yeah, don't, everybody stop squeezing your sockets, okay? <laughs> like, just yeah, let go. Uh, that that, that core buckle plate has had enough damage, oh, so man. let's not, let's not yeah. be squeezing it. So fine. We they must be periodontists. Well. They're looking for yeah. work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, must be. So you got the gauze in, right? And then typically, look, I, I, I like to think I give it two, three minutes. It probably ends up being a minute, right? In the real world, yeah. right? Because yeah. time and yeah. stuff, you know, I, I, if I audited it, right? I'm sure it's probably, mm. it's probably a minute. It feels like five minutes, but it's probably a minute, two mm. minutes, right? And you usually take the gauze out and I have a look and I'm just observing and I, and I, and I do mm. my diligence, I, you know, for 15, 20 seconds, sometimes 30 seconds, especially if their medical history is a bit funky. I'm just watching, okay? Yeah. And, and it, things, things are stable, happy days, give all the post-op instructions and off you go. But if you have someone who's just, you know, it's just filling up and, and bleeding still, just talk us through the, 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 the management of that scenario and how that could potentially escalate and what should be our next steps. The worst thing that uh, you can think is, uh, it's probably fine. <laughs> so the, it's probably fine. The worst three words in, uh, when it comes to post-op for oral surgery. If it's pooling and it's, it's not like uh, jelly-like, then it's not clothed yet. And it might be fine. You might send them away. It might be fine. You might just say, you know what, just keep biting on the gauze, go home, throw it away in 20 minutes. It's probably going to be fine. But it's those patients that end up continuing to bleed late into the night uh, that you have a problem. So what I would do in that situation is get a surgical suction tip and just hold myself. Sometimes the nurses don't have the dexterity for this. I'll hold it just over the edge of the socket and I'll just see how much is that pulling, how much blood is that pulling out of the edge of the socket. And if it's not really lifting up, then I know that it's pretty secure and solid in that socket. If it's immediately suctioning away and I'm seeing bone in the base of the socket, then I know that blood isn't taking. So I'll suck all that blood away and then I'll get another wet gauze and place it on top. And I'll, ha- I'll just say, look, wait in the waiting room for 15, 20 minutes. We'll check on it again. And that's the best thing to do at the end of the day. Just make sure that there's no active bleeding before you let them go. Later on, I'll, I'll get into a, an anecdote to explain why that's important. And also why it's very important to have illumination and loops when you're looking at these sockets as well. But we'll go down that road. <laughs> Okay, uh, sure. So the, 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 I, I agree with you. Get the patient to wait 50 minutes outside. And, and actually tell me if you do this routinely or not. I'd be interested mm-hmm. to know is, you know, the little um, surgical sponges, yeah. uh, you, you know, I, when I do my section, I like to cut them into three, put them into each mm-hmm. fruit. I don't know if that's mm-hmm. more uh, effective than doing one whole sponge or whatever. Yeah. And then sometimes just suturing as well, doing like mm-hmm. a, a mattress suture. I'd like to do yes. like an X yeah. shape. Yeah. Where does Same. that come in yeah. in the pathway? Is it is it better just to do the wait 15 minutes and you won't need a suture either? Or is it, uh, you know, some people might jump straight into the suture any advice on that uh that's a really good point jess like the if you're ever not sure i always i always err on if i'm not sure suit i'd rather suture and not need it than need it and not have it let me put it that way so if it doesn't look like it's the blood is stopping then a suture is all, always worthwhile the downsides to a suture are this one more food retention plaque retention and irritation to the soft tissues and the, it might be a bit more uncomfortable and be a little tight um, while the patient's healing initially uh, but the upsides are you drastically reduce the chances of um, further post-operative bleeding. So 
for sure. If you're ever not sure, it's always worth placing a suture. And the things I'd say about that are, number one, please don't squeeze the scarlet, the sponge and stick it into the socket because the whole point is you want that space in the sponge for the blood to imbibe mm-hmm. and fill. And a lot of people squeeze these sponges and shove them into the root sockets and, and then it's not doing anything. It's just mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's just sitting there and it, it'll just uh, fall out eventually. So like you just said, cut them, in, cut them into shape and put sponge in each socket or if you have a large socket, one or two sponges without squeezing them, just gently place them into the socket. So what I'll ask my nurse to do is, or myself, I'll suction the socket uh, so that there's no blood in there. I'll place the sponge in, and that will allow the blood to infiltrate and and set within the sponge. And then, like you said correctly, I think the best uh, suture is a cross-mattress suture. I try to put that in as much as possible. I just call it like an X suture, but it's called a, uh, the, what's the proper term for it? I don't know. I've heard people call it an X suture. Yesterday, um, I was speaking to a periodontologist. He calls it a cross-mattress. So cross-mattress. basically, okay, what, yeah, what you end up with yeah. is a cross over the socket. And uh, hopefully, we'll have a video for you by the time this is uploaded of how to do one of those. I'll, I'll just find a way to do one tomorrow. I'll pick an unlucky victim, and they'll have a cross-mattress suture. So... Excellent. Um, uh, now, now w- with good. that, now, s- some silly questions that you know we, yeah. we want to we want to just for, for the young colleagues with who I'm put myself in position less experienced. I'm thinking, could you? Is it ever worth just putting in the the, the sponges and then mm-hmm. leave, you know and and that's it, no suture, and then also just putting in the suture without the the, the, the sponge? Just you know, can you do either or? Because some people say, oh, I don't have the sponges or uh, mm. I didn't have the time to suture. Uh, do we know about if either of those other things work, or do we just have to do it together? If you don't have a suture and you only have a sponge, then just place a sponge. If Or vice versa, if you don't have a sponge and you just want to place a suture. The thing about a suture is if you do that cross suture, or if you if you don't want to do that, do two simple interrupted sutures, it's going to form a, a lattice over the, the top of the socket that will allow the blood to congeal on and clot and, and, uh, and form some kind of barrier. And on top of that, when the blood clot does form, those sutures are going to keep that blood clot in place or at least help a little bit. But but really, yeah, and, we'd hope all the, all our colleagues, you know, have yeah. access to sutures, and and maybe I mean, some some people yeah. who have access and just have been, you know, pe- out of practice. Sometimes you know you haven't done something so long mm. that you feel nervous doing it. And I, and yeah. I, I would suggest yeah. that if you're in that category when it comes to sutures, it's mm. so so important. Like I know everyone's doing like veneers and composite veneers and aesthetics, but you know we're dentists at the end of the day, right? The, the most basic thing is getting people out of, out of pain, removing yep. teeth. So it's always a good skill to just top up with the suturing and, and, and regain your confidence in that. Grab a banana. Anna, peel it, stitch it back together. That's the best way to learn. And it's it's very easy. You know, placing a suture is is very straightforward. Now, when you're placing a suture, the things that can get you flustered are a lack of vision. And if there's blood everywhere, that's going to make things difficult for you. So my three tips for suturing are number one, as much light as possible. And ideally wear loops if you can, so you can see what you're doing. Number what two. Give us the, you know, what mag do you use? <laughs> take a guess. 2.5. Seven point two. All oh, right. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. That's 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 way overkill, man. <laughs> it was. It was way. I got it for restorative, um, yeah. and then as a they're the refract the Bryant refractives, and my nurse was like, "I bet you can't take a wisdom tooth out with those," and I was <laughs> like, "Yeah, okay. Hold my hold my caster. Let's see what happens." And ever I'm ad- I'm addicted to it. You get addicted to magnification. The more of you course. go up, you just want more and more. So, yes. but yes, you can do oral surgery with seven point two times loops, two point five five. When I was coming up, though, I wasn't using loops at all because if I wore loops, my MaxFax consultants would laugh at me. They were collecting dust in my bag for years. And then one day I, I, when I was working in practice, I left them on. And yeah, it's it's mainly the light, really. That's the thing that helps the most, just having light, not having to angle a, um, you know, a chair light that's going to cast shadows and things that's um, going to mess up your vision. So definitely invest in loops if you're not using them and i'm surprised by how many dentists still aren't but um it's going to save your back it'll save your eyes it's true and with the light comment you know mr mccardle austin mccardle taught me back when i was a a dct at guys you know if you can see it you can remove it if you can't see it you just it's a bit it's a bit like and i often feel like this right i i I, i'm a little bit guilty of losing my wallet like a lot like if my wife's Mm. listening to this she'll be like very (laughs) she'll be laughing right now because i it's a a thing in my family that i i just lose my wallet a lot i'm actually gonna get one of those apple air tags and leave it in my wallet i have one of those (laughs) you have the same problem in your wallet as well (laughs) My house is always beeping. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, stuff. I know. I have one on my keys, right? My Samsung one. Anyway, so it's a bit like when I'm going into a bag, right? And I'm, and I'm just feeling around for my wallet in my bag, right? Yeah. It, it, it's 
it, it's hit and miss. Whereas I can mm. put, you know, shine my phone light in it, and then I'm much more likely mm-hmm. to find it. It's the same like that with teeth, yeah. right? <laughs> when yeah. actually removing the, the, that distal buckle root is so much easier and better if you get the seat position correct, the light, the magnification, it, it all matters. To be honest, Jess, when, <laughs> when I take teeth out, I think to myself, how did I do this without loops? Like, I have no idea what's going on. It's, um, I, but then the, it's, uh, if you forget your loops at home, then that's the other problem. So uh, maybe keep a backup pair in the practice. I, I've got, yeah, I've got three dependent. sets, man. I've got three sets for this yeah. exact problem. Because if, if, I, if I break one, I've yeah. got another one. And it's just, it's honestly, I, I can't do it without it. So I, I had one day in practice in like three mm. years ago when I had, I had no loops and it was like the worst. I said, I never want this yeah. to happen again. So I invested big time. I've got three sets now. I had to, um, I sent mine in for repair. And yeah, I, I had to go back to 2.5. So I still had loops, but it was just like... I felt blind. You get dependent on it. So I know, maybe every um, now and then take a tooth not, out without not the some worst, loops. To, <laughs> not the worst kind of dependence in the world. So, so yeah. it's okay. Anyway, but back, back, on, back, yeah. back, on, back, back on track. So you got the, uh, no, 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 please. I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying this. So the, we, the we, three we got points. The, the suit, we got the suture in uh, and that's going to help. And, and that should sort m- most of those scenarios out. So yeah. let's, let's say that that scenario is done. Mm-hmm. Now, before I talk about the one whereby everything looked good and then four hours later you get a phone call, which is what happened to me the other day, is there anything else you want to talk about that immediate management before we go into the... Well, I, ju- I just want to go back on to two other tips with the sutures. So like we said, magnification and light. Number two, very important. If you can't see what you're doing, it's bleeding everywhere. Suction everything, but don't just suction. Wash it out, rinse it out. A lot of people don't do this. It's bleeding, blood is clotting all over the place, the teeth are coated in blood, you're getting flustered. Get your three in one, no air, but just water and just give it a good wash. Wash everything away so you have a nice clean Okay, I'm so glad you said that. I just want to stop it. I'm so, so glad I said that because there's there's a segment of the podcast I sometimes do uh, called Am I Naughty If? And because mm. I've done this for, and I've got some videos in, on YouTube to do this, I, I, I do mm. that, right? And some people are like, wait, shouldn't you be using like sterile saline and stuff? <laughs> and I was like, oops, sh- should you be always doing that? And I, and I discussed it with Chris and he was a bit blasé about it. He was like, it's okay, don't yeah. worry. It's, you know, it's better than not, not using anything. Ideally use sterile saline. Any any comments on that in the real world? What, okay, <laughs> what do you think these people are going to do when they've left your practice? <laughs> yes, exactly. They're going to go and they're going to, you know, have a, a cup of water from a non-sterile bottle and they're going to have some tea. And, you know, the mouth is one of the dirtiest things in our body. So I, I, I'm, I don't understand this thing of like, I use surgical hand pieces always. And I use saline when I'm when I'm doing that. But when I'm washing the mouth out, the three in one, the Alpron water is still better than whatever it is they're going to ingest later mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. So okay. I'm so glad you said that. So I, I feel I, better about that. And fine. I've had no complications yeah. in the last so no. many years of, of doing yeah. this. And it just makes sense. The mouth already is full. And, that, and yeah, that is cleansed water yeah. we're using. It's, and it's yeah. probably I could go on a whole tangent about all that. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah, sure there's some it's... people who might disagree with us, but yeah. um, I think we're more in tune with the real world. So that's fine. Yeah, uh, g- yeah. 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 wash out. So carry on with that point, sorry. Yeah, so what? give it a good wash, uh, suction everything. And then you'll just have a clean field of view. You can see what you're doing. And uh, third is don't get flustered. Take a break. If you find your heart rate elevating and you, you're not thinking straight, it's okay to just put a little bit of wet gauze in, stop, and turn around, have a little bit of water, have a think, look at the x-ray, take a few breaths in and out. I still do it sometimes if I find myself getting a bit het up. And that's just going to help you focus more. And just remember, it's okay to be nervous and fearful because that's when your senses are most heightened. So that's when you're going to be focusing the most. Just make sure you have a clear mind when you find yourself in that state because that's what fight or flight is. It's focusing on the things that matter. So those are my three tips for suturing and dealing with blood in the moment. Amazing. And you know, if any speciality, any subspecialty that has resulted in elevated heart rate and, and adrenaline <laughs> is definitely oral surgery well, in, in yes. my experience anyway. So, so yes, to- totally agree, yeah. my friend. Okay. So, so we've um, got the tooth that the sutures are in. Yeah. yeah, sutures are in, and then you know, usually that, that that's fine. Anything on that before we then talk about the one that you know everything looked good, but then four hours later mm-hmm. you get the phone call, mm-hmm. or because usually, yep. uh, I mean, we assuming the medical history is all clear. This is all assuming that there's you know, they're, they're not on <laughs> two different types of uh, uh, you know anti platelets and all that kind of stuff. This is all like the standard, you know, our yeah, daily yeah. normal yeah. patient, right? So this is that will usually just do the trick in my experience and your mm-hmm. experience as well, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Fine. So the, the the one that you took out, uh, upper molar. 
and mm -hmm. everything looked great. Okay, you mm -hmm. took out the gauze, it, it, it looked amazing, looked like a nice jelly yeah. clot, you don't even get any oozing. Mm -hmm. And obviously you warned the patient, a little bit of oozing is normal, okay? And it's yeah. a mix with your saliva and sometimes it looks worse than That's it is it. and whatnot. Yeah. But you get four, four hours later, you get a call saying, yeah, it, it, it's still bleeding, is this normal? And, and then the, the other day, the way I managed it is I said, okay, well, um, did you bite on the gauze that I gave you? Because I always give gauze and I'm sure that's the standard protocol, right? We should be giving gauze. And she said, yes, I, I bit on it for two minutes and it's still bleeding. And I said, okay, well, listen, you need to bite on it for 20 minutes. All right. Yeah. And then so she did that and that was it done. Right. Okay. So the, no, yeah. no other issues. So I called her back mm -hmm. a few hours later. Yeah, everything's fine now. So that was as simple as that. Any yeah. other advice? Because in your roles in max fax departments, oral surgery, mm. etc., you're probably mm. speaking to general dentists, yeah. um, giving them some advice. Uh, yes. And one advice that I have learned and given before is the tea bag. Is, is it, t tell us about the tea bag trick. Is, is, it, is it legit? Do you, do you know about this? Now that you, that's the first time I've heard of the tea bag trick in years. So I've never used. And it's the different from uh, the tea bagging we would do at uni. Just, 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 just for those <laughs> guys who are just sniggering and laughing at the back because it, it's completely different. To, this isn't to halo <laughs> tea bagging and coagulation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the tea bag trick, right? Which We're I've used our age with now. a few patients. <laughs> yeah, no, right. Just make a cup. I said, make a cup of tea, right? Make a tea cup, cup yeah. of tea, love. Take yeah. the tea bag out. Wait for mm -hmm. it just to cool a little bit so it's still mm -hmm. still really warm. Maybe not hot, but really warm still. And then bite on the tea bag. So my um, my instinct is not to do that because when you put anything warm in there, it's going to cause vasodilation, which we don't want. We want vasoconstriction. So I wouldn't do that. Maybe a cold but, tea but, bag. But, but, the, but uh, yeah, well, but the, the reason, the, re the rationale, yeah. well, what Professor mm. Brooke explained to me at the time, this was mm. years ago, is the tannins. It's the tannins yeah. that cause an uh, mm -hmm. enhanced clotting reaction. And the few times I've had to advise this, and I call back, and oh, yeah, everything's fine now, kind of thing. So it's, it's work. It's, it's supposedly a, a, a thing. Okay. Uh, it's not something that you would recommend usually at the moment. That's, that, that's totally cool. And so what are the kind of advice that you would be giving? Well, now that you've said that, we have a lot of tea bags lying around the practice uh, from the nurses. So I'll ask them to stock them for uh, post-op. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Obviously, no, it's something um, the patients do at home. Everyone's got teeth. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. No, um, yeah. I, I might, I might try that. So let's rewind. So first of all, post-op instructions are so important, and I'll send you a link to my post-op instructions. I take out twenty teeth a day. So what I've done is recorded a YouTube video with my post-op instructions mm. that I show them and send to them. And among, you, you made a lot of really good points. So first of all, explaining what is bleeding to a patient, your socket's going to ooze. And the way I explain it is, imagine you put a little bit of Ribena in a glass of water and the whole glass turns purple. It's going to be the same with your mouth. A little bit of bleeding is going to cause a lot of red saliva. That doesn't mean it's, you know, it's pouring blood. It just means there's a little bit of oozing and that's normal. Bleeding is bright red clumps forming on the socket. And we've all seen it when they come back and there are these big bits of jelly over the socket and you pick them up with your suction and they're all clumped together. That's um, that's proper post-operative bleeding. So it's it's defining that to the patient, first of all. Uh, I advise people not to spit or rinse for 48 hours. I advise them to swallow everything. They can brush their teeth, uh, but let it just dribble out into the sink. Don't rinse and spit. And then after 48 hours, start gently swelling with salt water. You, you, you're stricter rinsing. than I am. For me, it's 24 hours, yeah. then you can start the rinsing. You're, 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 you're stricter, but you know, I think better to be safer yeah. than, than yeah. that's fine. I like that. Yeah. And then avoid sucking on anything. Straws. One, mm. one of the reasons not to... People say, I vape. Is that Okay. Any suction is going to create negative pressure in the mouth that will pull out blood clots. So avoid sucking in any straw. A lot of people, there's this instinct, I've been operated on, I'm going to suck in a straw. Drink from a cup, avoid sucking in anything. And then it's it's difficult dealing with people who like to spit. For some reason, it's come from their body, but it's suddenly disgusting to them and it has to be removed. So they just start spitting and spitting. And just explaining, the more you spit, the more it will bleed. It's counterintuitive, so trust me, please don't. And then like... Like you said, make sure they understand that if they're going to use that gauze, make sure it's wet. So when I was working at the Royal Cornwall Hospital, we used to do 48-hour on-calls. So we'd walk in on Friday morning, we'd get handed the bleep, and we'd walk out on Monday morning. It was nice because in the winter, you'll get like one to two calls a night. In the summer, it was crazy because everyone fancies themselves a surfer or some kind of like mountaineering genius. And you just get loads of facial lacerations and things from scra scraping the seabed floor, like falling, etc. Anyway, that, that's I'm digressing. But I got a call one night and it was this patient who had a tooth extraction and they were very distressed and they were still bleeding and they've tried, they've used the gauze. It's not working. Nothing's working. They're still bleeding. And I said, Did they okay. use a tea bag? They didn't use a tea bag. No. <laughs> no, <sorry. laughs> I, I find none. Like, um, <laughs> I just, I just. So, so uh, I just said, okay, are you wetting the gauze? No, 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 I'm putting it in dry. It's not wet at all. Okay. <laughs> wet the gauze, 
ring it out, bite down on it for 20 minutes, and I will I will call you back in 20 minutes. Waited 20 minutes, called them back. Yeah, it stopped. It, sometimes it's as simple as that. They may not have actually listened to the instructions you've given them, so just be very clear with your instructions. And just like right? my patient, they didn't yeah. do it for 20 minutes. They did it for two minutes no, or 10 minutes. Exactly, yeah. Know. yeah. Mm-hmm. And they want an immediate result. And th- and the other, the other thing to bear in mind is sometimes you will come across people who are undiagnosed, um, you know, hemophiliacs or, um, who suffer from thrombocytopenia or von Willebrands or something, um, just because it's not diagnosed doesn't mean there are people walking around there who don't have it. And you should treat every patient as though they may have a bleeding disorder that you're unaware of in the same way that we sterilize as though everyone has HIV. Look at every socket as if they have a bleeding disorder and be very wary because at the end of the day, yeah, you'll have 99% of patients who don't have any issues, but you'll have that 1% that really does have a bleeding issue that isn't going to be managed locally or through following your post-op instructions. And with does with need the to volume be seen. of patients that you've seen over the last 10 years and uh, extractions yeah. that you've done, I'm just interested to know, has this happened to you firsthand whereby they, they just kept bleeding and then you figured out, actually, yeah, you've got something going on? I'm trying to think. Not that I can, nothing, no reassuring. one springs to mind. Yeah. <laughs> it's it, reassuring. It is rare. Can, I love it, your point that you have to be, yeah. you know, keep your mind open to it. And then so should you give all that advice of the, uh, mm. of the gauze, wet it 20 minutes and it's still mm-hmm. not uh, happening. Then if, uh, usually if you're, if you're open, like if this was like a 9am extraction and you're still there at 4pm, they can always come in and you can maybe yeah. suture so it at that point. That's, uh, that's the next point I was going to make. Try and schedule extractions in the morning if you can. Uh, so don't don't book an extraction at five o'clock at night on a Friday if you can avoid it. Unless Typical. It's that's the one that's going to always go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, or if you do have an on-call service or have an agreement with a local practice, have a you know a group of practices get together and say, right, this is our on-call rota, etc. So patients have somewhere to go if there's an emergency. One of the practices I work in in Birmingham is twenty four seven, seven days a week. I don't think they've been closed once for like thirty years, even through COVID. This guy figured wow. a way to keep running. Which means that if there's an issue, a patient has access all the time. Now not every practice is going to run like that, but give them an option. Um no one wants to go and sit in A and E for three hours, um, waiting for the Max Fax SHO unless they have to. So it's always worth having a, a plan. But if you don't have that, try and schedule the extractions early in the day and ideally early in the week because their bleeding issue might not occur until the next day or day after that. So yeah, just try and tactically place your extractions in your diary. And, and so with that patient who continues to bleed, and despite you saying, you know, uh, bite on the gauze, make sure it's wet, be 20 minutes, and they, and they continue to bleed. I mean, there's really two ways to say that. Okay, now go to your hospital and get seen by the local maxillofacial to assess you because you shouldn't yeah, be bleeding. Yeah. Uh, at mm-hmm. that point, we can talk about hospital management, you know, tranexamic acid, all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. is it worth at the maybe four or five hour mark to then bring them in, numb, numb them up again, and then suture it because you hadn't, because you didn't need to, you didn't feel like you needed to at the time. Is there merit in that? Is that something that you would do in a hospital when you when you have a bleeder like later yes. on? That's the first line. So, and the thing is, like that, like we were saying earlier, if you practice suturing, you can do it. Like I don't mean to be sensitive or preachy, but these guys in hospital are dealing with mandible fractures. They're dealing with you know inpatients with cancer, all sorts of things. The last thing, or they're dealing with huge facial lacerations. The last thing they need is the dental extraction socket that needs stitching that the GDP could have dealt with, uh, but you've gone and added that to their enormous list of things to do. Unless you're in Cornwall, we have nothing to do. Send send all your patients <laughs> to the Royal Cornwall Hospital. No, I'm joking. Um, but yeah, you, you don't want to like unnecessarily burden max max SHOs. So yeah, the, it, you know, you're still in practice, the patient's still bleeding. So what I'd say is like you said, get them in, give them some local anesthetic, irrigate and suction everything until the socket is clear again clearly something's gone wrong with the formation of that blood clot in the socket so just clear everything out don't be precious about leaving whatever's in there in and then place your sponge suture and just from that point i mean how, how can you promote more how can you promote more bleeding at that point how you know well, sometimes you, uh, you want to create more bleeding like you say always curatage your sockets jazz very important i've seen you mentioned that point before on your mm-hmm. podcast and mm-hmm. um it's underrated however I'll tell you a story about curataging sockets that led me <laughs> to just some hot water. So, and a tip I learned as well after that. I'd, I'd watched one of your podcasts and you reminded me that it's very important to curatage your sockets. So I'd removed the lower left six with a very large abscess underneath it. So I was curataging away all this, um, all the tissue and everything that was left behind. Everything was going really well. I was very pleased with myself. I was 20 minutes ahead on my diary. And until I noticed a little pumping 
and spruiting coming from the base of the socket. And what had happened was by after curataging, I'd hit an accessory vessel uh, that had found its way uh, superiorly into the socket. And, and this wasn't just a little ooze bleed. This was actually like an arterial bleed from an accessory vessel. Now, when I saw that, there's there's a few different ways you can manage this. First of all, apply pressure. If that doesn't work, a tip I picked up. Again, uh, I should be, I should probably be asking someone, am I naughty if I do this? But you can cut this out if, if you disagree. Ideally, use a diatherm to cauterize it if you can. If you don't have that, if you have any bone scrapings, try and plug the hole with that bone and then apply pressure. If you don't have the ability to do that, then get a, a ball-ended burnisher. Heat it up on a flame and use that to cauterize. Press it down on, on the bleed and that will cauterize it. And I've, I've used that trick twice now and it's worked quite well. So that's how you'd manage something like that. And if you don't think that you're getting any luck with that, then at the end of the day, you've got to call the ambulance because this patient needs to be seen ASAP for diatherm. You don't want to leave that. It'll ooze a little bit initially, but what you'll find is the patient will wake up with a mouthful of blood later when you have these arterial bleeds. So don't mess around with those. If you're seeing pumping blood and you can't control it, that needs to go to the hospital for a diatherm. Amazing tip. I think someone is going to listen to this and then some years later they're going to face this because that could happen to anyone, right? Mm, uh, yep. And it's not happened to me yet, but it's so great to hear you say that mm. and how, how you said cool. And so you did the you did the, the heated instrument trick, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. heated up a ball-ended burnisher, cauterized. End of story, no problem. See, I don't uh, even know what a diathermy looks like. Like, it does it look anything um, like an electrical cautery or? Uh, very similar. So it's, it's like a little pincer, uh, and when they come together, they just zap. Uh-huh. They zap around and uh, and they they cauterize um, wounds. So you'll, um, I mean, if you've done a max fax job, they use it all the time when they're doing neck dissections and things. Mm, Funnily okay, enough, um, mm-hmm. after I'd done all this, I was tell- I was speaking to the principal later, and I was like, "Yeah, so this happened, and I cauterized it, etc." And she was like. Oh, we we have a diatherm. It, it's in the, it's in the cupboard at the back. We never use it. Like it, I don't know why I bought it. And I was like, oh, that would have been good to know two hours ago. Never mind. So yeah, also be aware of what equipment you have in the practice. And but, but I'm so glad and, that you were uh, able to, to, to share that tip. You know, I mean, if I'm just yeah. putting myself in in your shoes at that point, I, I wouldn't have thought of that to use the heated instrument. So I've learned something mm-hmm. for sure there. That's that's, mm-hmm. that's amazing tip. And maybe one day I'll need I need to use it. Obviously, you have to be safe about how you do this and stuff. Yes. Vital structures, etc. Caveat. ID nerve and canal mm-hmm. uh, and mm-hmm. ID artery. Do not do that in that location because you may end up damaging the nerve. Um, yeah. If you have a bleed from the ID artery, just try and get as much pressure as possible. And, that's, and that needs to go to the max sex to be uh, microsurgically dealt with. You don't want to end mm-hmm. up causing um, a numb lip uh, by yeah. using that tip. So this, this is for accessory vessels where you're nowhere near any major nerve uh, mm-hmm. that you're aware of. Okay, great. Um, so in terms of, because I wanted to keep this very much uh, real world clinical, I think we've done that in, mm-hmm. in our chat and I, and I had a good time mm-hmm. chatting with you. Um, anything else you want to add just on this topic? Because I'm glad we didn't go too much into the, the whole medicines. Because initially we were talking about, yeah. uh, we were too and about. I've been revising the SD SEP for days I know, in preparation sorry, for this. Sorry, but uh, you know, uh, you're welcome at the same time because now you're yeah. so hot on that. Uh, and that, yeah, that's know, great. Yeah. And, 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 and I had this like, you know, this this thing about half, I was speaking to my wife, I was like, yeah, I'm going to get on the podcast and we're going to talk about this. And she was saying, oh yeah, that be good and yeah and then talk about heparin and in my, in my mind is that heparin mm-hmm. uh, the last time i saw a patient taking heparin i, I mean in that's hospital, not real yeah. that's not exactly yeah. so i think what we've covered the ground we've covered in the last you know 40 minutes is going to really really help the, mm. the majority of dental practitioners uh, and not just the whole more hospital kind of stuff which maybe we'll bring you back for a part two i think uh, so if you guys would like yeah, to see a part a two to please about. uh comment below and let us know if you'd like to see a mirror again who's absolutely mm. brilliant and, and i like your real world attitude and, and and sharing uh, the anecdotes and stories oh, which has been you. great um how, how can we follow you on instagram on social media that kind of stuff yeah so on instagram it's dr bocus and you can put a text is up that dr dot because uh, we'll put that so, on so um yeah uh, just d-o-c-t-o-r and then b-o-c-u-s all one word bocus on instagram and uh, i'm on www.referanxla.co.uk and I'm happy to come to your practice as well if you want mentoring and um, and work with you on your cases or you're always welcome to visit one of my sites um, you know there's no charge for that or anything please feel free to come along oh that is amazing I'm, I'm, if there's any Patricia Rati out there anywhere near me and you, you want to just build your, uh, get your confidence back up in distractions you'd be a great mm. guy to to shadow and observe and uh, what, what, what you offer is it sedation 
and you know you could be the backup guy you could be the sedationist and the backup guy right i found myself in that position so i'll, I'll be sedating for dentists and they'll get a bit stuck and i you know i don't, I don't like to be a backseat dentist I, until someone asks for my help i'll be in the corner just what, looking at my uh, pulse socks and <laughs> um rate pulse rate um but yeah sometimes people have needed help and i'm happy to guide people and just you know Sometimes you, you'll be using an instrument wrong. You just won't be, you know what, you won't be looking at the bigger picture. And a little tip will help. For example, one of the people I sedate for in Oxford, one th whenever I take a tooth out, I'll give my anesthetic. And then the first thing I'll do is get my probe. And I'll use that like a luxator and do mm. like a six-point chart around the tooth. I do the same really thing. I'm so glad I'm saying this. Press it in. It will start bleeding. Uh, it will start socket dilation. And it will also help me identify... Where are those points that I can sneak my luxator in? Where, where are my luxation points? And I'll find little pockets and things through that. And, it, you know, I gave them that one tip and their principal called me a week later and they said, you know, he's been using that for all his extractions and it's completely changed everything for him. And, I, and it's such a little, a little tip that you'll pick up on. So, and I, I get all kinds of little tips myself, just watching oral surgeons and MaxVax consultants. So we all need to talk to each other and, you know, always be prepared to learn and receive. It doesn't matter how high up you are. Or how far along you are in your career, you're always learning. I'm still doing courses. I watched um, one of your previous podcast guests, the chap who does the wisdom tooth course. Chris, oh, oh, Nikki, Nikki Jamal, yeah, yeah, yeah. And guy. I'm do, I'm watching his course, and I'm, you know I, I do so many wisdom teeth, but I'm just picking up on so many things that he does differently to me and how he analyzes things. And I just love listening know, to his voice, man. Yeah. It's just he just such yeah, a cool a very guy to cool listen to. Voice. <laughs> <laughs> he's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to yeah. you, Nikki, once again for, yeah. for, for just always just <laughs> no, leaving yeah. such a positive impression with everyone. <laughs> his course is awesome. I'd recommend that to a lot of people. Totally. Um, totally. Uh, so yeah, but in in summary, uh, what I'd say is that key things are. Uh, if in doubt, suture, um, you know, practice suturing and uh, stay calm and just make sure you have a nice, clear, clean field of view by irrigating and suctioning as much as possible. Um, so and make sure you the, have your the, backup the gal or guy and, yeah, uh, nearby, yeah, I think. Make right? sure you have a mentor nearby who yeah, can uh, help you out. Yeah. That's it. Amazing, Amir. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's my pleasure, right. Jess. Thanks for having me. Well, there we have it, guys. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. If you want to get some CPD, you just have to answer a few questions on the app. You know this already. The website is protrusive.app. It's also an Android or iOS. I think the best way, the, the least buggy way would be the web app, basically, protrusive.app. Sometimes because my videos are so big, and the reason I have those videos hosted on the app is they can download it for offline use. But sometimes if, if you're going through a lot of it and scrolling through a lot, um, it can be a bit sluggish, basically, because the videos are just so big. So you always have the option of visiting it on the web app or on the official app uh, on Android iOS, the login is the same. I want to thank our guest again, Dr. Amir Alibokas, for a lovely chat. I wanted to thank Team Petrusa for their hard work on this episode. So that's Erica Allen Benitez, the producer and editor, Rakesh Singh, who did the premium notes for this episode, and Marie Benitez, who's in charge of CPD. Oh, and if you want to check out Neki Jamal's Wisdom Tooth course, which both me and Ali have done and we highly recommend, check out protrusive.co.uk forward slash third molars online. That way you get 15% off using the coupon code protrusive and this is an affiliate link. And the whole time I've been recording this intro outro, I've been distracted. My son has literally woke up early today and he's trying to not be a nuisance in the background, uh, but he's just about made it. Uh, so sorry if there was any blips in the sound while I was recording this. Uh, I'll catch you guys same time, same place next week.